Across the Fence will join two professors from the University of Vermont who recently traveled to China, where they got an up-close look at Chinese agriculture. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Agriculture is a vital industry in China. There are over 300 million farmers and the country ranks first in worldwide farm output, producing everything from rice, wheat and potatoes to pork and dairy cattle. Two UVM professors recently visited China. They toured pork and dairy farms, paying particular attention to on-farm biodigesters. Joining me are UVM Extension agricultural economist Bob Parsons and Professor Chin Bing Wang, who has taught in the university's Community Development and Applied Economics Department since 1995. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Judy. Now, Thank you. Bob, um, let's talk a little bit about, before we get to the farm visits, tell us when and why um, Chin Bing and you and Bob were in China. The primary reason we went to China was to present some um, papers that we had at the an international conference, uh, the Chinese Economist Society. Mm -hmm. And both of us presented some papers there of some research that we've done here in Vermont. I presented one on uh, some of the research we've done on biodigesters here in Vermont. And um, uh, Chin Bing presented a paper on uh, you know some consumption of dairy products related to the United States and China. And so, Chin Bing, can you give our viewers sort of an overview or some insights into what agriculture is like in China? Uh, you know, China is a huge country. The agriculture is very, very uh, important. And it has a long history of agriculture. And I think the major challenge for the Chinese agriculture is uh, it has only about 7% of the farming land on the earth. It needs to feed about 22% of the population. The agriculture sector has changed a lot since uh, 1978. I think a major accomplishment of Chinese agriculture is uh, right now it's able to produce almost enough food for the population. That is unbelievable. Yeah. And what are some of the reasons why that is? I think a major reason is uh, the uh, institutional change. Because from 1949 to 1978, everything was uh, controlled by the government. So since the economic reform started in 1978, and the farmers uh, start to have more freedom regarding what they produce and how to produce that and how to sell that, that has uh, made a huge contribution to the growth in the agriculture sector. And uh, for example, in 1980, and uh, China produced uh, less than two million metric tons of milk, but by last year it produced almost 40 million metric tons of milk. So that's a, a huge increase. That's incredible. And it's been a relatively short amount of time that that's happened. Yes, yes. Amazing. So following the conference, where did you, where did you visit? So we uh, arrived in Beijing first. Then we traveled to uh, Chengdu. That's a large city in uh, southwest China. So the conference was there. Then we uh, visited Xi'an. That's about uh, center of China. Mm -hmm. Then we visit uh, a big city uh, uh, not far away from Beijing, it's called Tianjin. Mm -hmm. And then Bob visited Beijing and uh, came back to Vermont. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so tell me a little bit about um, the biodigesters that you were looking at. Okay, we looked at biodigesters, particularly the one on the dairy farm. Uh, it really has a very similar technology to what we have here in Vermont. They collect the manure, uh, and uh, it's uh, for going through a digester where you uh, heat up the manure, and the manure uh, has bugs that heat it up and actually digest the particles and emit methane. The methane, methane is then collected, and, but one of the big differences is, whereas we're using the methane here and we're trying to burn as much as we can to generate as much electricity, there's a little different process of, in China of why they have it the way they do. Can you tell me about that? And I think uh, um, there are several major differences. And number one, in China, the major purpose for the digesters is for nutrient management. So many farmers do that to meet the government uh, uh, environmental regulations, a requirement for the, um, how to treat the waste. So the electricity and other products from the digester are kind of like a byproduct from the process. And also, um, most of them are uh, much smaller than what we have uh, in, uh, in Vermont. And also, the operation are 
most of them are seasonal. And the, um, um, in operation in the summer, not in the winter, and also they are not running 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And another uh, major difference is uh, for the electricity generated from the generators, they are basically used by the uh, farms. Mm -hmm. they, are not, uh, they do not go to the grid. Okay. And so what are, what are the demands for dairy products in China? And, uh, uh, historically, um, dairy is not uh, chi um, part of the diet in China for a majority of the population. But in the past 30 years, it has increased uh, a lot. And um, people start to drink milk and eat cheese and eat ice cream. And uh, um, for example, in China, every year, there are about um, uh, 18 million babies are born in China. So there's a huge demand for baby formula. And China, are pro China is producing a lot and also uh, import a lot from uh, US, uh, other countries. So um, according to our research, the demand for dairy products will continue to uh, increase at a significant rate. So that may uh, provide many opportunities for the U.S. dairy farms. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, I would say with the growth in the dairy consumption that there are more cows and more manure, which means biodigesters are that much more important. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, China tends to have a very diverse, uh, you know, with uh, you know, like maybe 12 million cows and 3 million farms, which means not very many cows per farm. But the farm we went to was a 700 cow dairy farm. Mm -hmm. uh, housing, like any farm that you would see in Franklin or Addison County, it was a freestall barn, milked in a you know, double 16 herringbone milking parlor. Uh, they were using an automatic scraping system as used in a lot of our freestall barns. They're feeding corn silage like what is uh, produced in, on our farms and fed to our cows. It would have made it look uh, entirely uh, uh, familiar to almost any farmer here. Uh, one of the things that is a little bit different is they import their hay, their alfalfa hay comes from California because of when you think of all the products that travel from China to the U.S. that we import from China, there's a lot of ships in that haul hay then back to China. And so they have uh, something hauling the way back. Now you think that might be, that sounds a little unusual for most of us, but that is what has been happening and has driven up the price of hay for dairies in California and the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so is that just because of the lack of land for, for growing hay? Yeah. And it really comes down to economics that uh, they can, you know, they make most of their money probably making the trip to the U.S. bringing the products there. You still have to get the ship back, so you have at least part of a load on the backhaul. And but still, they don't have the land to produce uh, probably as much alfalfa to produce feed for animals, and that gets to be a complexity within the China agricultural system. And as their po population has been increasing and more middle class, they demand more animal products that we see in the United States, Western Europe, and around the world. That as society increases, they end up uh, demanding more animal products. And another reason uh, China is importing a lot of agricultural products, food and feed, because uh, the quality from the U.S. is much uh, better. I think for the alpha alpha from California, the protein uh, content is much higher than that are produced in China. Interesting. And so what about some of the other aspects of dairy farming that, that we're familiar with, like raising calves? Well, one of the things that struck me there is if you go to a farm in Vermont, you'll see calf hutches, and that's like a little house the calf is in. And that's done to keep them healthy and keep them from maybe transmitting disease. And it's made out of plastic or plywood here. Well, in China, they were made out of brick. <laughs> Really? <laughs> and you know, you think, well, boy, they had to have a bricklayer build all those. So that really was a structural change. But still, you see the same basic framework where the calf has a place to go in. They have a place to come out, and they get drink their water and get their grain there. And they're fed right there in their calf hutch, and they're kept up off the ground. So the manure goes down through the pallets. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very interesting aspect there. But other aspects, it would have looked just like a uh, dairy in Vermont, except that the cows seem to be a little smarter. Because when their herdsmen come around, their herdsmen spoke in Chinese, and the cows seem to understand them. Wow. Our cows don't seem to understand Chinese. <laughs> Bilingual cows, that's amazing. Yes. <laughs> How about um, like corn silage storage and that kind of thing? Their corn silage was the same as what we would have had here. And we, it was stored in a trench. It's cut uh, in silos. Uh, 
from fields close to the farm. And what we had there in the picture is uh, you know, a facer which comes along and uh, kind of peels off silage off the edge, but it's the same thing that's used on farms here in Vermont to keep that uh, front of the uh, silage as even as possible to limit the amount that's exposed to air and eliminate any possibility of mold as much as possible. So they were doing everything like you would here. Uh, and a Vermonter, Vermont dairy farmer would have felt right at home except for the language that the cows <laughs> speak in Chinese. <laughs> now, Ching-Bin, um, you also visited some pig farms, and, and what did you see at those farms? And uh, again, we uh, visited uh, two uh, large ones. Like one of them had uh, more than uh, 1,200, 12,000 12, 12, wow. uh, pigs. So it's a very big uh, operation. That's very different from the traditional uh, pig production in China. And for most farmers, they have only like one, two, or three in their uh, backyard. So we visited two uh, commercial uh, pig farms, and they also use some new to uh, generate uh, electricity. Again, uh, the major purpose is to uh, uh, treat the waste and also uh, generate electricity uh, for the farm use. Is that a regulated um, by the government as far as environmental regulations? And China start to have very um, um, restrictive um, uh, regulations. So for example, those uh, uh, farms told us they had the digester because they need to meet the uh, environmental uh, requirement for the, how to treat the waste. And so uh, I feel that's something uh, very uh, positive uh, in China because uh, China is having uh, serious environmental problems. I feel this is uh, uh, significant um, uh, progress. Mm -hmm. And so when you were there too, Bob, you were talking a little bit about some of what you expected to see and then some things that surprised you. Well, I, I guess I was very amazed by the technology that is available in China today. Uh, they do have the agricultural technology. They are up. Uh, it's very hard to apply sometimes to the very small scale where people are still farming maybe a quarter of an acre or something like that. But I mean, the overall technology available in the country today, I think uh, one of the things that most impressed me was when I was at the airport, they had somebody cleaning the floors and it was on using, they had electric chair rigged up like electric, like we might have for our elderly that use those, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the uh, scoot around carts. And it had it hooked up to a, a floor sweeper and they were sweeping the floors with it. So you think in a country with China with so much labor that you thought of things being done by hand and you saw very little things being done by hand. But their agriculture is very up, uh, very intelligently applied. They're trying to mix it in with a lot of people. Uh, they've got land challenges that we don't have uh, because in our midsection of the country, we don't have the population pressures they have. So I, I was very impressed with what I saw. They're applying anything they best can. They do apply the science. They're using biotechnology. They're using biotech seeds. And uh, you just look at everything, you know, even at the hog farms. It was an entrepreneur that had also figured out we got too much hog manure, so they were running a compost fertilizer business where they were also bringing in food particles from restaurants in town and actually uh, composting it there at the, at the farm. They had a composting and then had a machine that would turn over the compost, and they had the whole apparatus to set it up to bag it and make bags of fertilizer available for consumers. So they were shipping their hog manure, mixing it with other particles, and sending it out into uh, uh, the public then for sale. And so that was another revenue stream for the uh, farm. So you know, that's one of our biggest problems. When we have animals concentrated, it's uh, easier to control them, easier to feed, and you have a concentration of uh, activities, but we have too much manure at one place. And so they were attaching that by making manure available all for compost and for fertilizer that's sold to farmers across the country then. Once again, proving that farmers <laughs> really lead the way when it comes to thinking outside the box and solving problems. That's right. Uh, quickly, is there anything that you think Vermont farmers could take away from what the experience that you had? That I think the whole thing is that uh, you know you constantly have to keep adapting, and whereas the Chinese are looking at the world for sources of food, they're looking at uh, you know uh, the West for different areas of technology, but yet like biodigesters, they've been available in China for you know a thousand years, if not more, and so. Actually, maybe they're coming around to use the technology that we think that we're adopting, but yet we're still learning a lot from the, how the Chinese do it, and I think they try to keep it much simpler to begin with. 
I want to thank you I, both. I think, if, especially, you know, when we move to local food and a small operation, maybe there are many things we can learn from China. Yeah. And uh, China is learning from us regarding the commercial production and large scale production. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.